Yeah, so um, welcome everybody to my to my talk. Um, my name is my name is Nuno. Um, I am delighted to be to have been invited to talk um, at this conference um, for two reasons. One, I, I really enjoy talking about biomechanics and talking about science and and what I do. And two, um, I, I actually did my my first degree. In this very same institution, the, the Faculty for Human Kinetics. So um, <clears throat> it's it's always nice to, to return, as as you know, some years later, um, and to to give this talk. Um, so even if it's just in a in, in a web format, um, <clears throat> but I guess it has its advantages. So you guys are listening th to me uh, talking in my lab in Scotland, in G Glasgow, Scotland. Um, so um, this wouldn't be possible if I had to be in Portugal. So, but you know, it's um, it's one of the benefits, one of the perks of of, of having a, an online conference. Um, so everyone across the world can tune in uh, at the comfort of your houses, and and that's that's always good. So, without further ado, my talk is about um, the importance of biomechanics in triathlon. Okay, and so uh, just a, a quick introduction a brief introduction um, what we do here in this in this kind of commercial laboratory if you want is we support athletes um, and everyday amateur athletes uh, age groupers and elite athletes as well uh, and we support them uh, in making the best uh, decisions um, in order to um, to have the best outcomes, be it increase the quality of life or be it having a better performance, um, and, and that's what generally we do uh, here in this in, in our lab here in Scotland. So the the biomechanics, I, I know this is kind of um, more or less everybody knows um, deep down what biomechanics is. There is a definition for biomechanics. Uh, which is um, the study of structures and the study of the functions of those structures related to motion and to mechanical aspects uh, of the biological system. So it kind of, it's a fusion of, of two sciences. Uh, on one hand, physical science, physics and biophysics, and on the other hand, uh, mechanical science. Um, and so what we really try to do with biomechanics is to understand um, forces, uh, forces that act upon objects and the, causal ca the causality of those forces on those objects. Um, and this is more or less what, what biomechanics is. Um, so what is the job of a biomechanic scientist or anyone who um, dives into biomechanics um, because you don't need to be a scientist to 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 use the scientific method or you know I usually say that anyone that engages in scientific thought and scientific reasoning is a scientist um, and, and so w what we tend to do as biomechanics scientists or as bike fitters or as um, perhaps coaches because coaches can also and perhaps they are in in a better position um, with, the, with the proper education and instruction, they're in a better position to observe the athlete because they do that um, for several hours, for several days, so they actually uh, are more aware uh, of the athlete themselves. So w what we try to do is actually to diagnose, to diagnose um, and to evaluate limb function. Uh, we then try to uh, modify either the, the, the forces and the, the, produ the production of forces of the athlete or modify any materials, any setups. So in cycling, we try to modify the bicycle, the shoes, etc. In running, we try to modify the shoe, the running technique. Uh, we also do performance evaluation because it's very important to, to understand if um, the performance of the athlete is being hindered or not by the by the biomechanical um, actions um, in, in their in their uh, main activity. So what we really aim to do with this is to increase performance, uh, reduce the, the risk of injury, and also increase the quality of life because not everyone is looking for performance, 
And if we really think about it, someone winning a race or someone winning the world title, we, you can think of it as also increasing the quality of life. So actually, the bigger aim is actually to increase the quality of, of your effort and, uh, and the increase the quality of, of your performance. So we have. So I'll be. I'll be. I'll be giving you a lot of uh, a lot of uh, case studies because I, I really like to. That's what I really like to do is to expose things and to show you the the variability that there is in a biomechanical assessment. And so we have here. So what we have here is a, is an athlete who came to the lab to do a, a biomechanical assessment in cycling. This is a cyclist. Uh, uh, this is a simple uh, motion capture that has been slowed down uh, from 30 frames per second to uh, half speed or I think a third speed. Um, what we can see, if you guys can see my laser pointer here, is um, this is the fr frontal plane. But if we notice the knee, the left knee of this cyclist, the, the right knee is striking very well, very nice and centered. The, the left knee, when comes extension, is is veering uh, inward in a um, in a valgus uh, motion. So when the knee approximates the medial line of the of the of the body, the central line of the body, we call that a valgus. Um, and and that's that's what what the knee is doing. So in in a first in a first just pre preliminary assessment of this, uh, if you think about a force uh, that has that has to go down to the transmission, down to the pedal, down to the transmission, um, we need to think about the vector that is going down and it's trying to follow that line of the knee, and we need to think about if the knee deviates from that vector, what are the components of the vector? Are, are there and if you know again um, if that is increasing the risk of injury or if that is decreasing the performance um, what we have here is a force uh, application of the same athlete so um, before he went on the bike I had him do a counter movement jump for those who don't know what a counter movement jump is it's demonstrated there so it's just a simple jump hands on your waist and then you jump as high as you can with uh, a, a, a loading component. And so what we see here in, the, in these lines, uh, so the blue line, the left leg is the blue line, and the right leg is the red line. And when we actually see when he's loading and when he's preparing to jump, so this is the, the, the peak force before he loses contact with the force plate. Um, so this is the flight phase here. So what we see here is a, a large discrepancy between the right leg, the power that the right leg, so this is measuring ground reaction forces in Newton, so this is the power that the right leg is putting down on the force, and this is the power that the left leg is, is putting down on the force, okay? And then this is when he, uh, so this is when he loses contact, so this is the last uh, phase of the, of the of the movement and this is when he lands so when he lands he lands with a big impact obviously he gets accelerated by gravity lands with a, a huge impact it's not in the graphic but then what we can see is that as he stops after the landing the left leg uh, is not supporting the body as well as the right leg okay if we add pictures onto this so this is what we were talking about. He's loading. This is the loading phase. He's loading a bit more. The knee is tracking well. <clears throat> we can see everything is nice and tidy. As soon as he starts putting power down on the plaques, we see a valgus moment of the knees. This is normal, at least for the right knee. We can see a, a very. We can we can see that the the knee has gone from this. From a wider stance to a to a, a narrower stance, it's normal because it's you, you're you're putting force down, uh, so um, there's some absor absorption of the forces. But what we can clearly see here, and and this is just you know just looking at it, uh, we're not doing a very detailed analysis here, but we can see the the vastus medialis, it's and the rectus femoris is it's it's got a. A, a, a more hypertrophic structure on the right leg than on the left leg, and actually we can see that the valgus moment on the on the knee on the left knee is much much greater, um, and 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 so this kind of accounts for the fact that that leg is not putting 
as much force down as that as the right leg. Now, this is a force plate. It doesn't measure shearing forces. If we had an accel accelerometer there that would measure shearing forces, we, we, we could perhaps see the center of mass uh, on the foot being diverted a little bit by that and being less diverted on the right foot. When he starts losing contact with the plate, we can clearly see the quadricep there on the right leg and the quadricep on the left leg that have different uh, hypertrophies. And, and, and this is a simple assessment. So this takes, this takes one minute to do. We get a, a, an initial picture, okay? We get, this is an average of three jumps. This is very important. It's very important that um, everything in biomechanics has to be reproducible, repeatable, uh, because the test, we test reliability uh, in biomechanics, it's, it's, it's very important. Uh, because it depends, we all have intrinsic intrinsic vari variability, so we need to repeat the tests to see uh, if something, so if the outcome of, of a test like this is actually a result of, of, um, of um, something that's going on or it was a one-off. So we average three jumps, um, all of them show the same pattern and this is the average of the three jumps. Uh, so we're fairly certain that the left leg is producing less power in the counter movement jump. That's the only thing that we can draw in the counter movement jump. It's producing less power. Um, that that is the only conclusion that we can draw. But this is starting to build the picture. So when we go back, and when we sit him on the bike, eh, what is that? And when we sit him on the bike, and when we see that leg there, okay, uh, we can see, we can already know what it's doing and why it's doing that and we can more or less determine if it's producing more power on the bike or not, or if there's an adaptation. And that's another thing that we will t we'll be talking next, because adaptations happen and they are uh, crucial in biomechanics. Uh, so we're, we're talking today about the importance of biomechanics in triathlon. Um, triathlon, uh, <laughs> I'm sure everybody knows, is composed by three disciplines. A open water swim. Uh, we no longer have the luxury of calling it the swim, um, the swim stage. It's an open water swim. It's a very specific uh, swim. It has different biomechanics, and it has to be. It has a different technique, and that has to be uh, built in in the athlete's um, training. So we have an open water swimming, uh, we have a, a cycling segment, and then we have a run segment, okay? Um, some would say there's a, a fourth discipline, which is the transition, which is uh, incredibly technical. So you have the, the, the T1, let me put my laser on. So you have the transition one, they call T1. You have to, while you run off the water with the goggles and your swimming cap, you have to start taking your swimsuit off. You have to run with, with your swimsuit. Um, we have, we see Gwen Jorgensen here, she's taking the suit off while she's putting the helmet on. And then the jump on the bike is also very technical. Um, not that there's any biomechanical component to this, but races can be can be uh, won or lost uh, in a transition. Uh, the T2 is also very um, technically demanding. You have to jump off the bike, run with the bicycle, and then put your shoes on and then start the run. So, uh, so some some would say that the fourth discipline has to be included in the training. Obviously, um, as you build up the the competition season, you have to train more. Of the, of the transitions, it's, it's more important as the distance of the triathlon uh, is reduced. So super sprint, sprint, Olympic, and then Ironmans is not as important as in the super sprint or the sprint. Um, the weight varies depending on the distance of the triathlon. And the focus of today's talk, unfortunately, I can't talk about the biomechanics of swimming in open water, the biomechanics of, of, um, of cycling and the biomechanics of running in just one talk, because by, by itself, um, the, th these three disciplines are, are, um, you know, are a conference by itself, a three days talk. So what I've tried to limit, what I've tried to do to limit the losses is to address perhaps the lower limbs. So we're going to talk about the lower limbs, the legs, because it's present and it's, it's, it's very prevalent in, in both, in two thirds of the disciplines, 
um, so the cycling and the running. Um, in the in the swimming, we can say it has a, a stabilizing uh, action there, uh, not so much a propulsion action uh, in open water, uh, but has a stabilizing action. Okay. So we know that the we know that the points of contact of the lower limbs are different in cycling and running, obviously. So cycling has a uh, three, let's say three general points of contact. We have the handlebars, the the pedals, and and then the saddle. Uh, you can you can say that the handlebars have two and the pedals have two points of contact. But just to simplify, let's just say pedals, saddle, and handlebars. The points of contact with the lower limbs on the bicycle. We're just going to limit it to the pedals today. Uh, and the running, the point of contact with the lower limbs is, is the floor itself, okay? Now, this, uh, the fact that the points of contact uh, of the lower limbs are like this in cycling and, and running creates uh, some challenges. Um, and for us to discuss those challenges, I first need to introduce the concept of open and closed kinetic chains. An open kinetic chain is, uh, uh, is as demonstrated here, is a, a limb segment that is performing an action and it's free in space. Uh, so someone lifting up a barbell, uh, a weight, um, and uh, we have an open kinetic chain at this end because uh, the, this um, uh, farther extremity, the extremity um, farther away from, from the center line of the body is free in space, is free to move. We have another example here in swimming where the, the hand is free to move about in the water and so this is an example of an open kinetic chain. In cycling and running we have a closed kinetic ch kinematic chain or kinetic chain. A, a closed kinematic chain for instance in, in running is when you're performing an action uh, so you're putting force down on your shoe and that uh, extremity, the foot, is actually attached to a rigid surface uh, or a surface uh, whose inertia is such that it doesn't move and that it creates um, what we call uh, reverse or inverse dynamics. So that uh, surface will not move, and so there's, um, and so we, we're talking about here the laws of Newton and and uh, more specifically uh, the the laws of uh, physics physics with the um, the so we have so when you when you create a force when you put a force down the shoe it, it goes down to the to the floor there's a ground reaction force uh, that goes up to the kinematic chain up chain up the body uh, and that force um, has several components but it's usually uh, of the same magnitude if there's no absorption of force through the joints it has the same magnitude um, and but in the same direction but it ha but is inverted okay so it's inverted um, and so in cycling we can consider that too we can consider that when you clip onto the pedals you have now closed the kinematic chain, which means that when you put the force down, some of it goes down to the transmission, but some of it gets uh, f referred back up, up to the relay stations. And the first relay point could would be the knee, the second the hip, etc., etc., etc. So one could argue that actually in cycling as well as in running, uh, the aim is to put as much force down and to have and to have a, a stiff or to have um, relay stations that will not absorb the, the reaction forces so that everything that you put down can go down instead of being absorbed up the kinematic chain. Um, I really like both of these images because both of these Im uh, images show you that in the same situation we have uh, different applications of forces different force patterns uh, and different biomechanics. So this is what is so interesting about biomechanics is that um, it really is uh, an individual case basis uh, kind of science. Um, and we, as scientists, we need to control as many variables as possible. Uh, and as athletes and as trainers, as bike fitters, we need to, do, to, to, to actually do variable controls. For instance, um, I'll give you a very nice example. If you're doing a bike fit, and you start the bike fit, you start the initial evaluation, you record some, some, um, um, some cycling metrics, some kinematic data. 
But you've started that evaluation doing 100 watts, okay? As the bike fit progresses, you're feeling better, you increase the wattage, now you're doing 130 watts and 140 watts, and you want to test the setup and you're feeling really good, uh, and, and, then you, and then the fitter re-evaluates you to compare if things are going according to plan, and now you forgot to go back to the 100 watts that you did your initial evaluation, and now your next evaluation, you're doing 150 watts. We know that this increase in force, uh, increase in power, is going to change your kinematics, and so obviously the recording, there will be a change in kinematics, uh, which might not be a positive or a negative one. I'm not, I'm not. There's no. There's no assumptions here, but we just need to be care. We just need to take care into take those little things into consideration. Um, if you do an initial evaluation at 100 watts, uh, 80 RPMs, then when you change something on the bike, when you uh, have a different setup, you have to try and control as much as you can so that the outcome is a representation of what you change and not a representation of, you know, um, uh, count, count founding variables that, w w this is what we call them, that you forgot to control. The right image is very nice. We can see almost every stage of the of the running cycle, the the the, the toe off, the first contact, the flight phase. So we have someone here initial, uh, initializing the the flight phase and also initializing uh, the, the 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 first contact. We have someone here mid stance. We have two people here doing the toe off phase. Uh, so it's a very nice image that one. So. Um, what is the problem then with closed kinematic chains? Um, and this is what this um, uh, slide is showing. Well, on the right here, when you have uh, rotations happening on the tibia, uh, and they're you know, and they are in a an open chain, those rotations can be absorbed by motions of the foot, by motions of the femur, okay, and and, and you know those torque moments. Uh, can be because the chain is open they, they can move freely when you have a closed kinematic chain um, if there is and because specifically in cycling and running when you're putting force down the knee down to the to the foot if there are any moments in the knee uh, they cannot be absorbed by the foot if we consider that the foot is working in a closed kinematic chain so any torsional moments that happen on the knee uh, or on the hip are going to stay right there and they're going to are going to um, increase the stress and the load on the soft tissues and not, and on the ligaments which are there to actually hold the joints together so this is this is the problem with closed kinematic chains and this is really important this is why it's very important for us in cycling and running to get that lower limb so when you when you guys hear about uh, everything starts in the feet. Uh, uh, it's not that everything starts uh, on the feet. It's not that the feet is the the, the biggest component. It's this um, it's this uh, concept that we're working in a closed kinematic chain. So the torsional moments of the knee, the knee, the knee is very good of uh, uh, is very good in bending and stretching, so extending and and uh, flexing. It's not so good in rotations. Uh, in the transverse plane, and it's not so good in these rotations uh, uh, either, the valgus and varus uh, rotations. Uh, and so that can, can put some load on, on, on uh, the knee structures, on the, on the ligaments that, that hold the knee together. Um, so that's why it's very important for us to address the foot, make sure that when the, the athlete is putting, putting power down, we don't see anything just, you know, veering too much and stressing too much up the knee and this is this is very very noticeable so as 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 coaches you can look at an, at an athlete and you can see um, and we'll see we'll see more examples uh, but you can see uh, if this is happening or not and then you 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 get this information you talk to the athlete have you been getting any pain you see the injury 
the injury history of the athlete. So you see that when he's used, so for example, he starts to put on more load in running. You can see that the foot is collapsing and pronating a little more. He's complaining with the with medial pain in the knee. So on this bit here, you put all of this, these pieces of the puzzle together, even without an assessment, and you know that he needs to go and see a biomechanic scientist or uh, someone who needs to address that, okay? So, um, so again, um, we have a very, very nice example of this uh, track athlete. I, I, I do a lot of uh, biomechanical assessments with uh, track athletes because we have a, 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 um, a velodrome here in Glasgow, a very good velodrome, which was uh, home to the European Championships and Commonwealth Games. It's, it's a very good velodrome. So there's, there's a, a big culture of track cycling uh, here in Glasgow. And what we see here is a track cyclist that came to see me. Uh, absolutely no complaints. He, he was fine. Uh, he had no complaints. He just came to see me because uh, he wanted a second opinion and he wanted to know everything was fine and he wanted to make sure that he was doing everything right. And this attitude also has to be embedded in the athlete. So we, we need to train our athletes from a young age to know the several uh, the several professionals in sports so that they can identify when they have an issue. They can identify the sources of knowledge um, so they can go and see someone. Um, so uh, this athlete, so we, we can start here with a simple photograph of his, so I told him just to stand naturally, just to find, find a stance that you're natural with. I had him walk, I had him stop, I had him walk backwards, etc, etc. And this is a, a very good, uh, a very good, um, um, a very good picture of, 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 of how he stands uh, naturally. Uh, and he's, he, he always is like this. So he's got his right foot that seems to have a nice arch. Uh, when he's sitting down, the arch is, is, is um, tall. He's got a tall arch on the right foot. He's got a very, very nice and line hyalux. So hyalux is the, is the first finger, so the, the toe, the big toe. Um, and, um, and, and so when we see the left foot, um, and uh, as, we, as, we, as we were doing the, the fit, he was, also, he was always complaining that the left foot wasn't quite right, uh, oh, and we were always addressing the cleats on the left foot. Um, but when we refer back to this assessment here, what we can see is that when he's sitting down, both feet have a nice arch, a nice elevated arch, I think 45 to 50 millimeters. It's a nice normal arch. As he stands up and he puts his weight on, on his feet, we see that the left foot has a, a collapse, a small collapse of the arch. Uh, it goes down more than 10 millimeters. It goes down to 40, 40 38 millimeters, uh, this arch. Um, interestingly, we also see that the finger now is is pointing uh, laterally, um, so so we so we have a, 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 a misdirection of the toe. If you sight now, this is very important. This is very significant in in in, in biomechanics uh, in the foot because this this joint here, the the so-called ball of the foot, so the first the first metatarsal, the joint between the first metatarsal and the and the phalanges of the first toe of the hyalux. This is actually where you put your power down, not only in cycling, but in running as well. So when I told him to just, you know, stand on your, on your toes, we see, we see a, 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 a lateral collapse of the, of the toe. This is absolutely normal. Uh, this is what usually happens, but we actually see that this one is, is, is um, increased further. So... Um, and, and as a biomechanist uh, scientist, I can al already see that this could, e could lead to a condition called uh, hyalux valgus. So it could lead to, to all sorts of problems here in the first metatarsal joint with the phalange. Uh, and also, if you don't have a stable platform here uh, to, to put your power down, uh, then this cre can create some, some performance issues as well. So as he stood up, uh, and he didn't know about this, he had no idea. So it's important to collect data. So the, the role, and throughout the talk you'll be hearing this, the role of the, of the scientist, the role of the physiotherapist, the role of the coach, 
uh, and even the role of the of the of the athlete colleagues is to actually see from 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 outside see the athlete from outside and say things like look have you noticed that your toe is like this or have you noticed that your knee goes in etc etc as we look at him from behind um, we do see a, a valgus uh, for uh, forefoot and rear foot uh, asymmetry uh, on on the left foot which is uh, identical to the right foot so um, um, so all of these all of these uh, considerations need to be taken into account when you go then onto the bike okay um, it's important for us to have a diagnostic capacity and ability so for instance looking at that um, um, uh, uh, helix uh, valgus uh, deformity let's not call it the deformity it's just the way that the function the way that this athlete is functioning at the moment um, and if we take into account um, the scientific progress and the scientific um, studies that have looked into uh, helix valgus and have looked into how this can impact performance and function um, we can see that for instance the the the, um, the transverse arch of the foot so that the arch that is uh, transverse to the foot that is uh, closer to the to the to the toes so we have three arches we have the middle one which is called the the medial arch so the the inner one the the lateral one and then we have one in the front closer to the to the metatarsals um, so we know that people that have this convent that have this this kind of function will elongate that arch so the arch is like that when the when the toe collapse it will elongate that arch uh, and and so we know that this elongation will increase with increasing loads okay um, and so this is important for us to address for instance in cycling we perhaps need to so in cycling you perhaps need to 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 use an orthotics device so that when he puts the power down on that toe and elongates the transverse arch, uh, that elongation is not detrimental to performance, okay? We also know that, uh, we also know that he's got uh, a, a, a collapsed arch when he puts force down, and we also know also from, 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 from several studies that uh, people that have uh, uh, flat feet or uh, uh, plainness, foot plainness, um, will exhibit a, a different type of center of mass um, uh, uh, measurements, and um, <clears throat> we we know that the force is put down differently uh, when compared with people with normal foot and and uh, uh, covers uh, foot covers so the claw foot foot with a really really high arch. Okay, so all of this needs to be taken into consideration when you're doing the biomechanical assessment. Um, and, and for that reason, uh, <clears throat> often what we see is the provision of orthotics or orthopedic devices. In running, we, we can address that with a shoe, a different shoe, and, uh, so, and we can address within the shoe with an insole. Uh, and in cycling, we can address that with also in the shoe with insoles, but also we have several pedal systems and we have several things that we can do to the pedals to uh, correct the function if there is a need for correction. Because, for instance, this athlete actually he 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 there was the need for correction, um, but. It might not be the case. That's why the athlete needs to be evaluated. And when you put an orthotics device in, you, you need to reassess it. So, for example, things... Um, so if you have an athlete going to a, a, um, a podiatrist and the podiatrist, um, let's say, uh, takes a mold of the foot and produces uh, custom insoles, um, what you need to do then is to reassess if the custom insole or if the orthotics device is doing what you want it to do. Because in human function, uh, most, so because in human locomotion and, and function, um, most things are mediated, are centrally mediated. So the muscles contract because of a, a central mediated process because we want them to contract. And when we put things in the foot that will 
alter the, 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 the proprioception and alter the, the, the biofeedback, the um, efferent biofeedback, uh, the efferent biofeedback. Um, we don't know if those centrally mediated processes are actually taking that and absorbing that in the function or actually they are fighting it. So uh, a very well-known example of this is a uh, <clears throat> is a reflex, or not not really a reflex, but a a a, a consequence. Uh, for instance, someone with a someone with a, and I'll I'll just go and get my foot. Someone with a flat feet that needs that collapses the foot inwards, so it collapses the foot inwards, and you put a wedge here to prevent that collapse uh, of the structures and what actually starts to happening is when you assess, reassess that function uh, instead of collapsing less because of the wedge now the intrinsic muscles of the foot, the muscles on the leg are um, you know um, are sensing that you are trying to tilt it the other way so actually now uh, there is a, an even further uh, collapse uh, of the arch um, so instead of doing good, it's it's doing worse. Um, so um, it's not just a case of producing an orthotics device and that's it, off you go. You have to produce an orthotics device. You have to retest it, see if it's doing what it's supposed to do, and, and perhaps you have to change it, reassess it, etc., etc. And it's it's a continuous process. And usually, when you produce an orthotics device, you produce it in a way. Um, that you have uh, pr uh, progressions, so you don't just, you know, produce a, 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 a large, a tall heel wedge to correct that. You'll do it in steps in order for the for the for the body to assimilate and to adapt um, to those to those changes instead of fighting them. Okay, so one of the things that we do um, as as biomechanical scientists in in cycling is to measure. Uh, the rotation of the tibia, the rotation of, of the foot in the in the transverse plane, uh, the for the um, uh, forefoot to rear foot valgus or or varus uh, uh, asymmetries, because we can then uh, we can then uh, use that information to set the cleats correctly. Uh, when someone is putting force down, is there a rotation of the, of the tibia? Uh, can that rotation of the tibia be accommodated? By the by the by the cleat system, by the the components on the bike or not? Where can we put that? Um, and all of this is very important, so that when the athlete is in is doing um, uh, is doing uh, the um, the training or, or the or the race, he's not thinking about all of those things. He's thinking about his performance. Okay. Another thing, just a word here, because I see a lot of of um, 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 let's say easy access, easy accessible knowledge regarding cleat wedges. Um, the cleat wedges uh, is being advertised as, as as being a way to correct the knee when someone has a collapsed knee, a valgus knee, um, and and a tibial rotation. And um, this is not the case. It's not straightforward. And this goes back to the fact that when you use an orthotics device, you have to reassess. Uh, uh, reassess the function. So when you put, so to me, it's strange to to kind of um, uh, to think of the wedges as if you put a wedge here to 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 correct uh, any sort of of misalignments up the kinematic chain. To me, it's strange to think with the amount of bones, ligaments, and joints. Uh, it's strange to think that the wedge uh, will not be absorbed by all this. Uh, degrees of uh, freedom of the foot so and that's and that's really the assumption that they're doing there with the wedge system which is when you put a wedge the foot will not absorb and anything that you put on the foot will immediately translate to the knee and this is this is not the case i haven't seen this in my practice and we'll see examples of the literature the scientific literature where this is not the case as well so for instance this is a very nice study that um, they used wedges up to 10 degrees uh, varus and valgus, so both both uh, both sides. So the the, the motions on um, rotations on both sides. There's no difference on the on the knee. Um, 
um, when you put the, the the wedge, so the knee does not does does not uh, does not uh, the, the the wedge. Uh, let's say information does not translate to the knee being corrected or not corrected. What I have seen in, in my practice, and this is from, from a, um, uh, an athlete, uh, a, road, a road athlete, he came in with foot pain um, in, the, in, the, in the tuberosity of the, f the fifth metatarsal. So that's the, the pinky toe and the tuberosity is that, that prominence there that we have um, uh, outside of the foot. He had pain there, and you can see where he had the pain, and he had a, a well, he had an inch to inch to wedge uh, 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 here. So, and this is the pressure map, um, and as soon as I took the wedge off, uh, there was immediately more pressure being distributed uh, through the foot, uh, and then when I put an insole, just a, an over-the-counter insole, uh, even with the, the arch in the wrong position, he felt immediately better because now we were able to kind of paint that pressure across more area of the foot. And we know that when you, you increase the area uh, of any given uh, pressure application, the uh, force application, the pressure goes down. So the force was the same, the, the conditions were the same. I don't know, I can't remember, 120 watts that he was putting down. Um, and uh, as we increase the area, the contact surface with an insole, even if it's the wrong insole, we reduce the pressure because now he has more, uh, more um, area to put the same force. So that was really the first kind of the first um, hint that actually the wedge, instead of correcting, what it's just doing is just increasing uh, pressure uh, where the highest bit of the wedge is. And so as I look more into this, we have another example here with someone with cleat wedges. So these are the wedges that we often see. So these are the wedges that we often see, um, uh, like these, where you, you stack them up to, to, to make a nice, a nice height there. There's also a little bit of height there. Um, and, and so someone came in with a, a system like this, and obviously uh, when I recorded them, there was, there was a lot of pressure there. Uh, the knee was tracking the same. Uh, there was there was no no variation as, uh, of of you know the only thing that I noticed was that the wedge was just simply increasing the pressure when he was putting force down because what the wedge is, what the wedge simply is doing is just doing that to the foot. Now the assumption is that it's going to do that, but it it, it doesn't. Okay, the knee stays stays like this. So when I took the wedge off, immediately felt better, um, and uh, and then we progressed the fitting from there. Um, uh, track athlete again um, came in, leg asymmetry, um, leg length discrepancy. We can see the uh, medial malleoli; they're not aligned at all. There's several te several tests to do this, uh, but. The, the force plate measurements, the, the, all the kinematics in, in the cycling were spot on. This athlete was completely compensated and adapted to their leg length difference. The body has several means and several uh, solutions for this. And when the body is well adapted to that and the function is good, there's no need to intervene. We've got another example here, uh, a more extreme example. This was uh, this was more than 10 millimeters leg length di di difference, um, which uh, in some um, um, practices it would you know, automatically it would be um, um, it would be grounds for you know just you need an insole because you have a huge leg length discrepancy. Uh, when I had him, this was a cyclist only. So we have to take that in consideration. So we know that perhaps he needs he needs an orthotics device for walking, because we have a phase in walking where we have two supports, but we have to think about running where you have a single support. Um, you never have two supports at the same time. So uh, does the leg length difference does does that impact the running? And we also need to think about the cycling uh, where yes you have. Two supports at the same time, but you have other structures that can be used 
uh, to adapt to that length, length di difference. And so when we go and see his pressure map uh, on the saddle, we see a very nice stable saddle. There's no, not there, he, he doesn't have more pressure on the shorter leg uh, than he has on the right. We see a nice stable hip. We see ha he has a pelvic rock approaching one degree, which is incredibly stable. He's, he's got a very stable platform on the hip there. The pelvic rock um, is when the hip rocks from side to side. So, so if you consider the rock as you go down to the pedals from side to side, and there's the rotation on this plane, there are other rotations on the hip that we're not going to talk about today, but if we take into account these rotations, he, he does uh, very, very small variations. Uh, I've seen, I've seen um, 10 degrees of motion there. I've seen 15, someone who's really, but, and this is a very, very stable person, very well adapted. Uh, we see a leg angular range. So the angular range of the leg The angular range of the leg is, so imagine this is someone's knee, uh, when you're cycling and you're doing that, okay, this is how much the knee goes from here to there in degrees. We see it's similar from, from one side to the other side, okay. Um, but what we can see here is that the foot angular range is different. So um, what we ended up discovering is that some people adapt uh, by having a different angular range, he was adapting. So when we had, when we reached the knee, both knees were doing the same range, which meant that one of the heels, one of the feet, and this is the angular range of the foot, as he goes through the pedal cycle, he goes through plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, so extension and, and, and uh, flexion. One of the foot is doing more than the other one, thus compensating for that difference. Uh, so it has more amplitude of movement on, 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 the, on the ankle. So obviously this athlete did not need uh, shimming, did not need uh, wedging. He was perfectly adapted. He was perfectly stable um, and uh, just with a, an increased uh, angular range on the foot. Uh, and I didn't see any need to actually correct for that angular range. Uh, we did test it. Uh, we, test, uh, we, test, uh, we tested uh, doing stacking up the, the, the cleats. Uh, and what happened there was that then the, the adaptation went on further up on the, on the hip. And so the hip became unstable because of that. So when we took it out, he was really stable on the hip. He had a stable platform, a stable core to put power down. When we put the shimming, um, he had an unstable hip, okay? But the angular range of the foot was the same. And here we have to make a decision. And my decision was the biggest relay station is actually the hip. That's, that's the big relay station of everything that's, that's going down that's going that's happening on the lower limb and everything that's happening on the on the on the upper limbs and i want that to be a very stable platform so my decision was not to interfere with his already um, uh, adapted state the role of of a biomechanics scientist in cycling uh, the the ultimate role i think is to uh, is to get an athlete so this is a build let's call it this is a build for this athlete he needed a new track bike okay uh, he and and the role of a biomechanics scientist or uh, uh, um, or anyone who works in this industry is to actually get an athlete evaluate the function and uh, suggest outcomes uh, to meet the athlete not the other way around uh, it, the, it, it's not uh, it's, it's more difficult to have an athlete already bringing us equipment and changing the equipment than to build something for the athlete. And this is, this is a very difficult process because there's a, a lot of things needs, needs to be taken into, into consideration. Um, there's a, some maths involved into um, um, calculating uh, front-end geometries and etc. etc. and distance to the bottom bracket and, um, and all of that. And, you know, when you change something physical on the bike, is there a repercussion on the athlete? Uh, does the kinematics of the athlete change or not? Uh, and all of that needs to be taken in, into consideration. This athlete had a very particular requirement, which was 
he wanted a truck ride that would that could do could be used for bunch racing so that's when you race in a peloton or uh, and and he wanted also uh, the track bike to be able to be used for pursuit racing and and so a lot of a lot of uh, consideration was given into that and we were able to get him a track bike where by changing the saddle height you can see that the saddle height changed uh, changing the saddle height, changing the saddle foreaft, uh, changing the, 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 the front end configuration, we could more or less maintain, for instance, the same knee extension uh, with a different saddle height, um, and we could maintain performance. Uh, and using two completely different geometries, because we don't really care what's inside the, the contact points, we care about how the contact points change uh, the kinematics of the athlete um, we had we had to consider the saddle itself the saddle is a whole new topic it's a whole different ball game uh, because it had to be a versatile saddle versatile enough that he could do the pursuit races and do the bunch races with comfort with stability um, etc and so um, this was one of my most successful builds because um, uh, we were able to just from this from this position here, we could just tell him we could ju we I just gave him a list of to dos. So you need to take this off, put this in, move the saddle up, move the saddle forward, and this is a different position altogether. But I already know what it did in terms of kinematics, in terms of power production, um, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, so that's it for now. Uh, I do not want to extend myself. Um, I know that the the attention is difficult in front of a, of a monitor. It's different when we're live and interacting with people. I'm not too sure how um, the organizers are going to deal with any questions that you guys might have, but uh, I'm leaving my email if you want to send me a question or two. Uh, I might just collect them all and do a further video presentation to answer them, if that's allowed, or uh, I leave that to the to the organizers of the conference to, to let me know if um, how they, they uh, are planning to address any questions that the audience might have. Um, that's it for me. Uh, I'm really happy to have been able to, to have been invited to do this. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, my talk. I hope you guys enjoyed the conference. And that's it for me. Thank you very much.